There she is. Been around for a long time down there. And for all we know, her best years are most likely still to come. Oh yes, we may dream about how we see the future. But when you look through the eyes of the real dreamers, you may be just a little surprised. I see an amazing world. Everything's connected. Everything's really smart. It's like everything thinks for itself. Cars that drive themselves. My house says hello to me when I come home. It's like, hello Camden. It's like my house has a brain. Yeah, it's like everything has a brain. I get to think more about the things I want to think about. I want doctor visits that don't hurt. I think smartphones will be a trillion times smarter. Not just smartphones, smart everything. I see a better place to live. Yeah, me too. It's a very cool world. That's my dream. And mine. And mine too. I can't wait. And so when you add it all up, we've all got our work cut out for us. But because of many of you in this room today, we're also well on our way. On our way to a better world, a smarter world, a world our children dream about, and a world that together we can surely deliver. Renaissance, enabling the smart society. Good morning. My name is Ali Sept president and CEO of Renaissance in the Americas. Welcome, we're delighted to have you here. We have worked very hard to prepare the courses and labs that you're about to participate in in about 45 or 50 minutes. When we were putting this video together, the thought that came to mind was that the sensationalism that exists in the news today, wars, famine, austerity measures, and all the challenges that we as adults face are very stressful. And oftentimes, I found myself very worried for, our ch for my children's future. I have a 14-year-old son and a 12-year-old daughter. And I found myself being very stressed and concerned for, the, for their future. But I realized that when I talk to my children, they have a completely different perspective. They see a future full of possibilities. Sometimes they say they want to be a doctor. Sometimes they say they want to be a football player, a ballerina. I'm sure all of you who have children have experienced this, where your children from time to time change what they want to be in the future. That says they see a world, a future full of possibilities. While we're here today, Renaissance is here today to share with you the latest techniques and the latest products that we have to offer for embedded applications. And you as excellent embedded designers are here to benefit and walk away with a few gems. The underlying unity and connection we have is our joint responsibility for the future of our children and the next generation. If we go back to the early 1800s, the world's population stood at 1 billion. Fast forward 100 years, to the 1900s, and the world's population doubled to 2 billion. Fast forward 100 years to today, and the world's population stands at 7 billion. We also know at the same time, throughout these past 100 years or so, extracting fossil fuels has also become a challenge. Our resources are becoming more scarce. At the same time, there's a third dimension and the third dimension is the fact that all of us are utilizing more electricity and more power because all of us have more gadgets and more electronics surrounding our lives. So the purpose of this presentation and the focus of this presentation is to talk about how we as solution providers and you as embedded designers can find a solution to these diametrically opposed forces. More, more people, more inhabitants, more users, less energy, and more energy requirements per individuals. The smart society can be addressed, or the challenges facing the smart society can be addressed by
by four areas. Low power electronics using low leakage semiconductors, taking advantage of the proliferation of sensors. Sensors are becoming ubiquitous around us. Taking advantage of the signal chain, what Renesas provides, which is analog, microcontrollers, and the power stage. And then finally, security. And I'll talk about why that's important in a smart society. So let's begin with low power semiconductors. If we go back to the mainframe era, the focus of computing was really executing faster transactions. As we fast forward to the PC era, the focus was faster graphics, again, faster execution of instructions with limited focus to power consumption. And of course, in the last decade, as the networking and the internet grew around us, the focus was how do we push more video, how do we push more packets down the pipe? Throughout these decades, there has been little regard to how we address power consumption. It's all been about performance. Renesas, on the other hand, for the past three or four decades, has been focused on low leakage transistor technology. Our microcontrollers are developed with the concept and with the very intent focus of developing very low power consuming technologies. And we'll talk about that. So as a result of this past few decades, in general, embedded systems have focused on performance and there is now an imbalance, there has been an imbalance between performance and power consumption. At the onset of this decade, we have seen a shift in this balance. We have now commercial electric vehicles on the road. We have computing devices that truly do consume low power. So we have seen a shift in the mentality of embedded designers toward focusing on low power consumption appliances. I will touch on one of our microcontrollers, the RL78, which addresses the eight and 16 bit space. We mention true low power because I know you as engineers are, are always skeptical with specmanship. We know that some suppliers you know, fine tune their MCU architecture so it works very well in one mode and not necessarily in other modes. And oftentimes you have a challenge duplicating the results in your end system. Renesas provides a true low power microcontroller in this area. And I'll show you some of the numbers. In run mode, the RL78 consumes 144 microamps per megahertz. The closest competitor is company S at 150. Remember I said earlier, competitors fine tune their microcontrollers to be low power in one mode. Now, as we go to the next mode, which is the halt mode, you'll see that the RL78 consumes less than half of one microamp. But the previous competitor, competitor S, which was the closest, now you see is off the charts. Let's go to the stop mode. In this mode, and in smart society applications, this is one of the modes that your MCUs will most likely always be in. You see the RL78 is really showing off our low leakage transistor capability. And now in this case, you'll see that company T, which was closest to us in the halt mode, is off the charts. We have also added a very special mode called the snooze mode, which is unique to Renesas. The snooze mode allows, for example, the A to C to wake up, do some measurement, and if it's necessary to turn on the microcontroller to go in the operation run mode, it will. If not, it'll go back in stop mode. And you can see how much power savings you'll have if you're running your system at eight or 32 megahertz. Incredible savings using the snooze mode. Now, Throughout DEF CON, uh, most of the courses will be using our, either the RL78 addressing this 8 and 16 bit space or the RX addressing the 32 bit space or the RH addressing the high performance space and the automotive space. 
We just announced yesterday an RX100 series, which is the 32-bit family focused on low power. And some of the courses, or one of our courses, will focus on comparing its power consumption, which is best in class in the industry, relative to other 32-bit microcontrollers. Let me now talk about sensors. As I mentioned, sensors are around us. They're becoming ubiquitous. And in order for the smart society to be effective, we have to take advantage of our analog real-world environment. Let's take a simple example, irrigation. Oftentimes, we drive by parks, golf courses, or even lawns where we see the driveway is wet. That's because water seeps through soil at different rates. Soil is made up of different compositions. There's clay composition, there's sand composition, there's actually five types of soil composition, and water seeps through these compositions at different rates. This is why you see dry spots and wet spots. Now imagine if we embed sensors, moisture sensors, in the ground. And the moisture sensors will be able to communicate back to the control panel if that area of the lawn has had enough water. And we know water also is very precious. So not only do we want to conserve with the energy that delivers water, but we also want to conserve water. Of course, as embedded applications are connected to the internet, you will know, your system will know if there is rain in the forecast that day and will prevent from the irrigation from watering the, the lawn altogether. Now let's take this sensor concept to the next stage. We know in the automotive arena, more and more companies are deploying frontal view cameras for safety. We also know that they're deploying radar, frontal view radar for safety. However, none of these sensors alone are adequate to provide enough intelligence for the onboard computer to make a smart decision for safety purposes. So the next stage in utilizing sensors is sensor fusion, where you need to have enough performance with your microcontroller to be able to take in these, uh, these different types of sensor data, fuse them, and make an intelligent decision. At this DEF CON, we are showcasing in our lectures and labs the RH850, which is based on our very advanced low power 40 nanometer process, which can take in input for multiple types of sensors and execute for the right results. Now let's look at conference rooms and building environments. We see the deployment of humidity sensors, temperature sensors, passive infrared sensors, and of course, federally mandated volatile organic compound sensors to detect deadly gases. Detectors using our analog microcontroller and power semiconductors are being deployed in local areas to take advantage of this raw data, fuse this raw data, and make some intelligent decision so that some, so that decisions, intelligent and proper decisions can be made for that ambience. And we'll go into more details. Here's an example. These detectors who take localized sensor information and provide intelligent information back to the central unit can aid a, an emergency response team so that the emergency response team will not have to go to every floor in every area. They will know where to focus on for saving lives. So you've seen sensors, sensor fusion, and detectors. Now let's talk about how detectors are built. The signal chain is what we're referring to. So all of these sensors, most of them come in the form or provide analog information. And so this analog information first has to be conditioned, amplified, so that the microcontroller can receive it in the right format. Then the microcontroller will 
fuse this information, and make some intelligent decision. But remember, you're no longer in an on-off world. You're in a world of multiple analog and multiple forms of information. So you need a highly powerful microcontroller, low power consuming microcontroller that can mathematically and algorithmically compute this information and make the right decision. And of course, coming out of the microcontroller is the power stage, which will invoke a decision back into the real world, whether it's turning on a pump or turning off a pump or a solenoid or a switch. As I mentioned, all the courses here are focused on RL, RX, or RH. Last night, yesterday, we introduced a new technology, and if you missed it on the exhibit floor, please be sure to check this out tonight. It's smart analog. It's a singular package, a singular device, that has programmable and reconfigurable analog front end, which is basically made up of comparators and op amps, mated with the true low power RL78 MCU that I just talked about, all in one package. So using a web-based GUI IDE, you can design, test, and validate your system in one day without having to build a physical system and tune the analog part all day long. It's an incredible engine. So remember, it's one device, one package, with a programmable and reconfigurable analog front end, which can take advantage of all the sensor data that's going to come into this device. And of course, your component count will be reduced almost 10 to 1 when you think about it. You no longer need to have your resistors and uh, comparators and uh, diodes and capacitors on the board because it's all going to be programmable, reconfigurable in this one chip. Let's talk about security. With the Internet of Things, which is a part of the smart society, machines are going to be connected to everything, to the network. So with machine-to-machine -machine connection, it's very important for you to secure your information and secure the credentials of who will have access to your machines. But when we, when we talk about security, we're really talking about authentication. And typically, in machine applications, there are three levels of authentication. First, you have to authenticate the user. Second, you have to authenticate the machine. And third, you have to authenticate the services. So in this example, if a friend comes by to your house and wants to charge their electric vehicle at, vehicle at your house, obviously you, want, you don't want to pay that. So the utility company will authenticate your friend in this case, which is the driver and the owner of the car, so they know who to bill. They'll authenticate the electric vehicle so that they know what kind of charging is required for this vehicle. And of course, the services will be authenticated so they know how to build, where to build, and so on and so forth. Let's look, at, let's look at another smart society example. This is a glucose meter. In this case, you'll authenticate the user, which is the patient. So for privacy reasons, you want to make sure that the patient's medical information is not compromised. You don't necessarily need to authenticate a glucose meter, but you want to make sure it's calibrated so that the reading the glucose meter provides back to the medical facility is truly representative of the patient's reading. And of course, when the medical facility is going to provide a prescription, that prescription has to be secure and authenticated. We have shipped almost over 3 billion secure MCUs over 30 years, an incredible experience in this field. Now, why do I share this? Why is this important? You know, if I was a DRAM company, I could boast about much bigger numbers. But when it comes to security and secure microcontrollers, there is a definite art with how you make these secure. Let's look at the example here. Of course, you want to protect your data, your program, 
So that's the first level. And what you do is you lock it with a key. Then in machine-to-machine -machine communication, when you make a connection with another machine, you want to encrypt your key so the machine at the other end will be able to decrypt the key and have access to your information and know that it is you who is authorized to make this communication. And where our experience comes in with 30 years and 3 billion shipped is with the physical tamper-proof design that we put around this. So that if someone wants to probe the die or someone wants to represent themselves as an authorized while they're not authorized user, physically, this die will almost self-destruct and prevent access. What I have done now is talked about the four fundamental areas of developing or providing the required technology to enable smart society applications. Now I would like to talk about three applications in the smart society area. I'll start with the home. With the home, the focus will be in-home environmental detectors. Now, the home example will focus on the behavioral aspect of the smart society. You see, many of us today, our generation, habitually have not yet reached the point of constantly, consciously turning off the lights when we leave the room or turning off the air conditioning when we leave the house. So at least our generation have not reached that level of habitually and consciously saving energy. So there's a behavioral aspect that needs to be addressed using technology. So using the same detectors, detectors can fill the gap. So in this case, dimming the lights, turning off the con air conditioning, dimming the blinds, and so on and so forth can all be done automatically using a combination of sensors that detect the environment as well as these detectors, hence saving energy. I have a two minute video from Gainspan, Greg Winner, CEO of Gainspan, who was also here last night and is here today, an ecosystem partner of ours. The focus of his discussion is addressing that behavioral element. Let's take a look. Here at uh, Gainspan Corporation, uh, our goal is to connect things to the internet and connect people to those things. We're uh, investing in uh, smart home technology, uh, primarily to make things easier to use, especially maybe even fun to use. Uh, more specifically for uh, smart energy, it's not just about making something easy to use, it's about saving electricity and costs. So for example, we're investing in a smart plug technology where you can control your lighting without having to rewire your, your whole house, uh, smart appliances, smart thermostats, uh, even the ability to remotely check if your garage door or if your door is locked and even remotely lock and unlock your door. So, uh, so one interesting example is a Wi-Fi enabled smart thermostat. So it can, uh, just like your regular thermostat, it measures the temperature inside your home. And also, through the connectivity that's provided, you can also see what's the weather. So you know what it is today, you know the weather predictions. And then also through this connectivity, you have the smartphone interface to the homeowner. So you have what the homeowner desires are, what the commands are, if you will. And those things are all brought together in this smart thermostat. We've got to make it where uh, consumers and homeowners want to use the products. And so they've got to be easy to use, they've got to be fun to use, and they have to be pretty. Here at Gainspan, a key technical aspect is low power consumption. Uh, to achieve this, we actually go to a very low power consumption state. Then we have the ability to wake up very quickly uh, perform some operations, and go to sleep very quickly. Uh, this is critical in the ability to uh, add sensors to existing uh, homes. You're not going to rewire the home. And in addition, the whole purpose of smart energy is to save energy, not increase the energy usage. 
Thank you, Greg. So you noticed we need to conserve energy. And what Greg talked about is addressing the behavioral element by automating and making it easy to use. And also, you know, a lot of these buildings, it's difficult to rewire. So we provide low power wireless solutions so that this can be realized. Now, let me talk about commercial buildings, the second application in the smart society. And specifically, I want to focus on HVAC motors, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning motors. That, those are the big motors that sit on top of the roof of this hotel and enable uh, either cooling or heating for us. I don't know whether you know this or not, but according to the Department of Energy, HVAC motors, as well as lighting, makes up for 60% of energy use in commercial buildings. However, and unfortunately, almost all of the motors that are used to power HVAC systems in this hotel room, in this conference room, and in thousands and thousands of hotels and conference rooms and buildings across North America are made up of a simple on-off switch. If it's on, the motor is working at full speed, full capacity. And it's not exactly a comfortable solution. Oftentimes, you know, you're sitting in these conference rooms and you're either cold or hot. Rarely are you just comfortable. However, our solution for the smart society is to provide an inverter-based technology combined with the detectors that take advantage of the sensors in these rooms, in these conference rooms. So remember I talked about the sensors that will measure the ambience, passive infrared sensors, temperature, humidity sensors, all of these video sensors will measure the ambience. How many people are, do we have a thousand in here or a hundred? And then that information is fed to the MCU, which will then use mathematically intensive algorithms that will determine what speed should the motor run at. And you'll have infinite control over that motor. Remember, 60% of the energy used in commercial buildings comes from HVAC motors and lighting. And if we can use this technology sensors, the detectors, and an inverter technology to reduce the energy used by commercial buildings in the Americas. Can you imagine how much power will be saved? The RX600 is a 32-bit family of microcontrollers that was architected from the very beginning for addressing the smart society applications. Intense in math, intense in algorithms. The DSP hardware provides for single cycle Mac, repeat Mac, barrel shifting, and comes with nine DSP instructions. And unlike other MC architectures, its response time is amazing. And of course, when you have a lot of math, having a floating point unit is like adding a turbocharger. But what makes the whole solution very special is the flash monos technology that we have embedded in this, up to 100 megahertz with zero weight states. Now, in an inverter system, you also need the power stage. And oftentimes, the inefficiency of the inverter system comes from the six IGBT inverter switches. At Renaissance, we use a very sophisticated thin wafer background technology so that we can reduce the conduction losses as well as the thermal impedance losses of the IGBTs without sacrificing the short circuit ruggedness of the device. So you see, from the go-get-go, we're focused on developing microcontrollers, analog and power products, specifically focused for addressing smart society applications. The third application is the smart grid. 
Now, everybody knows the smart grid is focused on load balancing so that we don't continue to build power plants for peak demand. So, so that's the philosophy behind the smart grid. Now, we know the utility company is going to have access to your home, to your appliances, via the neighborhood area network through the smart meter that's attached to your home. And if you opt in, obviously, during peak hours, your devices or your appliances will not be able to turn off. Imagine if you live in Las Vegas, desert, high temperatures, 6 p.m., a lot of people come home. Everybody wants to turn on their air conditioning at 6 p.m. That puts a lot of load on the grid. But if you opt in and one neighborhood is allowed to turn on at 6, the next neighborhood at 6.15, and the next neighborhood at 6.30, you modulate the load. But let's add to this the electric vehicle you just increase the complexity by an order of magnitude. Imagine the same people come home in Las Vegas, and not only do they want to turn on their air conditioning, but they want to charge their vehicle. Let's listen to Mike Burton, who is here from Grid to Home, two-minute video on how this issue can be addressed. And he's also teaching a course on automating the smart grid for smart society. So electric vehicles are a big challenge for utilities. They represent a fairly large load, sometimes more than one house. Outside your home, you have a transformer that feeds five or six houses. So adding charging for electric vehicle is going to add additional loads to the transformer. It's OK today when maybe you have one vehicle in the neighborhood, but when, if everybody has electric vehicle, there is insufficient capacity of that transformer to support that charging. So therefore we need intelligent charging. So Smart Energy 2 provides this intelligent load management. It allows scheduling of the vehicles to be charged at different times, but overall will not overload the transformer. So how does intelligent load management work? So if we knew the state of the charge and we knew when each vehicle was required for use, then we could schedule them to be charged appropriately. For example, if six vehicles came home in the neighborhood and three were required that night and three were required the following day, we knew the state of charge and we knew the capacity of the battery, then you could intelligently charge those vehicles to ensure that everybody has their vehicle ready when they need it. The impact for utilities and consumers will be lower energy costs. As example, we will not be using or building expensive power stations that might only be used for 15 minutes in the year. We can deploy more renewables. These tend to be more intermittent energy sources because clouds affect solar, wind affects turbines. Smart Energy 2 balances these loads. And energy can be consumed at the cheapest cost. Thank you, Mike. RDNA and RR&D as we develop our products and solutions for the smart society, are focused on four fundamental areas. First is how do we enable you to generate energy? Second, how do we enable you to store energy? And third, how do we enable you to control it? And of course, save it. So all our products and solutions are designed and developed with these four fundamental areas in mind. As I mentioned earlier, we have developed over 120 lectures and labs. We've spent at least the past three, four months developing content that is not marketing or sales oriented, rather solution oriented. We're very excited about sharing this with you. And we're looking forward to the next few days engaging with you and talking with you. We hope you take away some gems back to your work so that you can design for the smart society. And remember, together we have a responsibility. And our DNA is always focused on social responsibility. We're glad to have you here. Thank you very much.